San Francisco New York based design and branding firm that he established in 1999. He's also the chief creative officer at Jawbone. You can see the Jawbone up on his wrist. Uh, he's collaborated with renowned, renowned partners such as Herman Miller. We're sitting in his sail chairs. Uh, Jawbone. <laughs> this isn't a product placement advertising forum, but we, tr we try to celebrate who we bring in. Uh, Jawbone, GE, Puma, Prada, and many others. Yves Bahar believes that design should be a force for positive social and environmental change. He is well known for his humanitarian work on projects such as One Laptop Per Child and See Better to Learn Better. For each of these, he was honored with the Index Award, making him the only designer to have received the award twice. Bahar's works are included in the permanent collections of museums worldwide, including the MoMA in New York, the SF MoMA here in SF, the Santa Pompidou, and the Art Institute of Chicago. Bahar is a frequent speaker on design, sustainability, and business topics. He has given talks at TED, the World Economic Forum in Davos, the Clinton Global, Global Initiative, and now the Googleplex. Please welcome Eve to the Googleplex. Thank you. Thank yeah. For the, for the nice welcome. I try to keep it a little bit short. So let's let's kick this off. How and why did you become a designer? <laughs> yeah, let's start with the easy question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so so I you know I, I first became a designer um, because I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to write stories. I was, I was a teenager. I was. 12 or 13 years old, and um, in Switzerland there wasn't really a school for design. There were, yeah. you know, my parents were not in design either. But so I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to, to tell stories. Um, and um, my high school teacher kind of discouraged me um, uh, from that, um, which kind of I slowly became aware that it was possible to tell stories through design. Um, and so it became it became my new passion and the thing I dedicated myself to probably from the age of 15 or so um, and probably got my 10,000 hours at when I was 20. Yeah, um, I'm glad about 10,000 hours. Yeah, and um, um, you know, it's been just all I do and what I do since then. Um, so, you know, when it comes to telling stories, I brought a few, a few slides, I don't know if, because I, you gave me a nice list of questions which I think a lot of you um, uh, participated in uh, in coming up with, um, but you know, like when you when you get to work on the the type of projects we work on, um, you know, telling telling stories and perpetuating stories is um, is uh, you know has become what I what I feel you know not just I can do, but you know a lot of designers can do, and this is probably one of the nicest stories and one of the nicest things that ever happened in my career, which is you know Uruguay. Uh, having a stamp um, and um, you know to support and to speak of um, the hundred dollar laptop totally which um, every single child in Uruguay between the age of six and eighteen years old actually has one every child in um, uh, in uh, public school um, has uh, has one of the laptops so I have a whole sheet of these stamps yeah the presentation <laughs> isn't just stamps though. plus 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 my father um, so when I said my parents are not in design, you know, my father was essentially a, uh, is a philatelist, yep. and he did that. You know, that was his um, sort of childhood passion. So stamp collect collecting and being an expert in stamps was uh, was was his thing. So after twenty five years or so of practice of design, I kind of got around to got around to having a stamp. Perfect. So who's who's influenced you? I mean, uh, you know, if we think about uh, some of the like, you know, there was a recent exhibit of Dieter Rams at, mm -hmm. at the SF moment. I went there and I was like, wow, Johnny Ive obviously received such inspiration from this. You know, if, is there a equally profound influence on Eve Bahar? Um, you know, in, in many ways, I feel, and this is where I have another little visual. Uh, unfortunately, they all look a little wider. Like they gain a little weight over lunch. Um, um, there's a distortion with the screen, but um, so so. I mean, of course, there's there's designers, uh, 20, 20th century designers that had uh, a big influence on me. You know, whether it's Saul Bass or Charles Ames or George Nelson. Um, and I'm also a big admirer of people who have built um, companies, who have built businesses out of. Uh, processes um, that they've discovered and that they they they've 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 uh, they've kind of owned through design. You know, somebody like Issey Miyake, for example, which I was very lucky to do a, a couple of projects with. Um, but my, you know, it's it's less of a stylistic um, 
uh, influence in my, uh, on my part. You know, I'm not really style driven. Mm -hmm. um, to me, um, design, you know, or architecture or graphic design isn't about just imprinting a certain style and repeating it over time. Um, it's really about finding the context in which your design is going to be and, and, and doing something unique or magical or important, you know, in, in, in this particular area. So, um, but I, you know, I'm generally influenced by makers. Um, I would say people who make things, um, whether they're designers or entrepreneurs, is kind of what gets me out of bed in the morning. Yep. And these guys were incredible makers of their times, whether it was, again, graphics and, uh, or furniture. Or furniture. Um, and in many ways, you know, have um, influenced not just American design, yeah, but the whole, world, um, the whole world of design uh, since. And I think in many ways, they were also the best thinkers of their time. You know, the... the uh, you know, Charles Eames didn't really follow a style, you know, for, for a few, you know, initially he really created um, with the LC2 chairs, you know, this, this amazing way to, to bend uh, plywood and then to kind of have a similar style in, in plexiglass and um, uh, uh, fiberglass, sorry. Um, and, but then he also went to aluminum with the aluminum, uh, aluminum group chairs, right? And, and so you can't really speak of a repetitive style or signature across his work, but you can speak of somebody fascinating, fascinated by making, innovating, uh, and, and, and creating something appropriate, both um, from a socioeconomic uh, standpoint at his times, but uh, also sort of on the cusp of material and technology innovation. So, you know, those are, those are strong influences in general in my, in my, uh, in my career. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of Dieter Rams as well. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but it's uh, less because of his style, but, and more because of the way he was able to deeply influence Brown, uh, you know, the, the, the company, um, um, you know, from, from a design point of view um, and help the company build itself through design and through brand. So in 1999, you start Fuse Project. Kind of what was your vision in starting Fuse Project, and, and kind of is it still true today? Kind of what, what you hoped or had seen or wanted to be in existence when you started Fuse Project? Yeah, in, in 99 I started Fuse Project. It was um, the high before the, 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 the bubble yeah. uh, uh, burst, um, uh, the dot com bubble. Um, I started it because I felt like a lot of people were speaking about integration, how different design fields were going to come together, how um, uh, interaction design, user interface, industrial design, packaging, brand, uh, were going to merge or should merge, but nobody, in my opinion back then, was practicing it. And so I became kind of obsessed almost about, um, about practicing a, f a form of design, which actually I had seen in practice in the Eames office. Yep. Um, I mean, not personally seen, but I had spoken, I had my first job actually was one with, um, with, uh, with a person I had worked in the Eames office. And so I was fascinated with this notion of a multidisciplinary place where we would literally fuse all these different types of design disciplines um, on our projects. Of course, uh, when I started, it was just me and a computer, so I was the multidisciplinary <coughs> designer, but we've built the team now to, um, to uh, 250, um, you know, really diverse group. And that's the name Fuse Project comes out of this idea. Of fusing together things. Exactly. Yeah. So you mentioned, you know, Ch Charles right. Ames, you know, they, they had a very unique shop down in LA. Kind of how would you yeah. describe Fuse Project as a, as a culture, as a, as sure. a company? So, <clears throat> so what, I, what I believe in is, is, you know, for a while design got broken down into these, 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 these tiny little specialties. Design got, um, um, in a way, almost obfuscated and became became very much relegated um, in, the, in the sort of corporate food chain um, to providing a service, a graphic design service, um, you know, brand or uh, app and software or advertising or strategy. These became, you know, broken down. And, and what, what was the most important um, uh, factor in the 80s and 90s was really marketing um, or advertising in the way that you build the ethos, that you build... Um, the way a company is known in the world, you know, that you build the brand. And so what, what we believe is more of a 360-degree uh, process where 
everything influences the you know the other elements always from a design point of view but if you're building you know a, a user experience um, or the name of a company or um, the way you know it's gonna present itself visually um, or a product um, we do all these things at the same time sort of in uh, in uh, in parallel rather than sequentially as um, at what, what was traditionally done in the um, uh, 80s and 90s, which means that the team, the way the team works and the culture is very much about that as well. So we all share desks. We're not, there's no divisions. There is no uh, departments in a sense. There are practices. You know, people are, come from a certain practice and they're good at something, but everybody has a voice in how we build businesses and how we help um, uh, company, companies sort of build themselves uh, by design. And it, uh, it's, it goes, the same goes for seniority. There isn't really uh, a hierarchy of practices or a hierarchy of um, seniority in, in the team. Yeah. So we tend to work around very collaboratively um, around big tables. We'll set up labs, as many labs as we can, that essentially study, research, and develop solutions to, to a certain uh, problem. Or, um, and... Um, and what you'll see is, is tons of materials, you know, sketches, drawings, diagrams, um, thoughts being um, uploaded on, on, on walls um, and constantly sort of picking up and put back up, you know, taken down and put back up. So it's not an ivory tower type of process at all. Very hands on. It, it's very hands on, um, very much about making, very much about stress testing ideas with design um, and, and building building that as a multidisciplinary team. So it's interesting, right? At Google, if you look at a project, we probably have <coughs> a PM, we have engineers, you know, designers are all distinct roles. It sounds like it's in stark contrast to, to a project, a Fuse project, where things are, are much more organic and probably less controlled or less structured. Yeah, I don't is know how structured things are here. Yeah. You know, maybe we should ask the audience how they feel. Yeah, structured. maybe we can bring this up later on. Um, but. Um, <coughs> Yeah, I would say you know the the um, the idea is to get sort of maximum amount of participation. That said, our teams probably don't look that different from yours. I mean, we have you know outside engineering firms, outside developers, outside you know specialties that come in and complement whatever we're doing at the moment. Um, and people do come from a from a from a place of knowledge and specialty, you know, maybe initially. Yeah. But they very very quickly become sort of T-shaped people, um, um, you know, in 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 the sense that they, you know, they have they have deep knowledge of a certain area, but they come they, they come they become really really good at understanding the whole process and being able to participate and plug in, um, um, you know, in the whole process. And because we're addressing, we're constantly addressing new problems. We're not really working on old, you know, old problems. We're really always addressing new challenges or new types of companies or new types of opportunities. Um, those skills are, are, are fundamental for that. So the approach um, that you used in the last project isn't necessarily immediately applicable in your current project? No. I mean, the, the, there's, certainly, there's certainly an approach, but the resolution is, is going to be uh, different. There's certainly a way that we do things, you know. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if that's covered in other questions, but we start with ideas. Yeah, and then we 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 build products, companies, uh, expressions around those ideas. Well, it's probably a perfect segue because you know what one of the questions that definitely came up when we kind of opened this up to the community was kind of what are Eve Bahar's like ten principles, right? If you know Dieter Rams has ten principles that have become very you know widespread if you're if you're into design. So what would be the you know Eve Bahar equivalent, right? That kind of guide. Sorry. <laughs> <clears throat> I realized I was like I, I printed because uh, I, I, I couldn't I couldn't remember my own ten principles, um, um, and besides I don't really have I don't really have the. Do you want to cheat? I actually have them printed out. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, this wasn't thought, scripted at all. <laughs> no, I was I was you know I was I left my uh, my own little sheet with your questions and, and and just a couple of ideas I wanted to touch upon in the car. Yeah. And then I got here and I was all macho. Thinking, ah, oh, that's fine. I'll I'll figure it out. Um, <laughs> but those those I, I um, so so a while back. I said, this this is something I said about three or four years ago. So it may have evolved quite a bit. But um, 
first of all, you know, my, my, my number one principle is design is how you treat your customer. You know, the best definition I can think of uh, for design, and people always ask me, you know, so what is good design? Yeah. And mostly when they, they ask you this question, they always think about, you know, what kind of style or what, kind, you know, what, what should something look like or feel like to be considered good design, to enter a museum or to, be, to win competitions or to win many, many customers, right? And my only, you know, my, my answer here is not aesthetic. It's really about, you know, how businesses, um, you know, practice what they do, what they sell or the services they offer uh, should be about how they treat their customers. And design can significantly enhance that. So, um, you know, if you treat your customer from a, uh, well, from an emotional standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, from an ergonomic standpoint, uh, from a health standpoint, uh, you're probably, you know, doing good design. Um, uh, the second one is, um, for me, design must be integrated throughout the organization. Um, it, it, it isn't a sort of nice add-on at the end um, of the process. It isn't something that, um, it, it isn't a surface layer, it isn't veneer. Um, you know, uh, good design needs to, to, to live throughout the entire organization to have an influence at the beginning and to have an influence at the end and everywhere in between. Um, and um, so the third, third one relates to that design is not a short-term fix, it's a long-term engagement. Um, that's the way we work. Um, there's lots of people who call you up and say, look, you know, we just need a logo, we just need a website, you know, and, and you'll be done in three months. And, you know, and that's not the way good design is done. That's not our client you want. It's not the kind of client we want, but it's not also, it's, you know, the clients I want uh, depend on, mostly depend on what kind of quality I'm going to be able to create with them. And, um, and so, you know, it's not about short-term fixes. It's really about thinking long-term, you know, how a company wants to build itself, you know, by design. Um, the, th the fourth one is um, design must be driven from the top. Um, this is a part of the discussion we had at lunch, you know, how you get people to stick to, to the initial intent of design. How do you get um, um, sort of a, the initial vision to be implemented and executed throughout? Um, and for that, we need uh, supporters, and we need supporters often that, um, that come from the top of the company. This is something that people need to believe in uh, top down in order to be executed throughout in the right way. Um, um, I think number six is with design, the solution to the problem will be different every time. Um, it isn't, you know, design isn't a formulaic, um, you know, five step or uh, 10 step program. Um, it has to be both the process and the outcome has to be custom. thought, you know, custom made, custom thought. Um, I find this fascinating today because. There's so many different companies coming into, um, into realization that design is important. Um, pharmaceutical companies, uh, um, you know, distribution, shipping, logistics companies. I mean, all kinds of unexpected people realize how much better design can, um, uh, can, uh, can, uh, can, can realize things for them. And um, um, the process is fundamentally different. Um, and, and we need to accept that. I think, I think the, the time of sort of consultants presenting you, you know, the five-step program, and by the time we get to number five, you know, you'll have good design in place. Mm. Ten um, times more revenue. Hmm? Ten times more revenue. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, is, um, the ROI is, is high. Uh, is, uh, uh, isn't going to work. So, so design is really about finding solutions that are going to be unique, um, uh, you know, and, and, and a process that's going to deliver the solutions. It's going to be probably different every time. And then finally, um, um, this, is a, this is never ask customers what they want, ask them about their aspirations. Um, I think it is our job, the, the job of the designer, to, um, to conceive of the future. Um, I do think it's important to listen to people. I think it's important to listen to people before you start and after, you know, and after and during what, you know, um, uh, the process, but asking them what you know what the future should be like is um, is um, 
you know, I don't think it's going to work as well as designers who are sort of living and breathing this process um, uh, all the time. Um, and who will also bring, um, you know, if, if, if um, I mean, I've quoted this recently, you know, if, uh, if you ask people, that's um, when, the Ford, um, when the Ford Model T was built, you know, if you, uh, uh, Mr. Ford said, you know, if you, if you ask people what they wanted uh, back then, they, they would have said faster horses. Um, and, uh, and um, you know, designers thought of the car. Yep. So you guys weren't paying attention, that was seven, right? Seven, yes. So, so less but better, right? Theater Rams had 10 principles, mm -hmm. you have seven. <laughs> yes, I, I don't mean to uh, improve on Dieter, but. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, I need the card back, it's scripted. Oh, yes. <laughs> what, what's, the, what's the next question? Let's see. All right, give us a sense of how you approach design. So, I mean, is there something okay. uniquely, <clears throat> uniquely Baharian? I've never heard that, Baharian. Baharian, but, yeah. Um, I coined it, trademarked it. Um, I have a patent on it. Um, usually we do that well, but... Um, <laughs> um, so, I think, again, it isn't about style, and certainly we tend to base our work in ideas. And we tend to really find... Um, just a way to speak of something, or a way to express something, or the way to, um, um, you know, the way a, a way to make everyone kind of inspired or delighted by a certain product or a certain, um, um, you know, digital or physical or, or certain, you know, the offering of, of a business. We try to find that sort of that key notion that. Um, is an aspiration that may exist but hasn't been sort of fulfilled yet, and that becomes our key, um, our key notion, our key principle. Um, and I can probably go back. You know, it's a little bit abstract, but I can go back to probably almost every product we've done and say this was the key moment of the key idea we tried to uh, express through all these different kinds of executions uh, that we try to express uh, in the product. So what, what was the... Let me see if I had a, something to illustrate that. Um, I don't know what... No, yes, well, that's for the next question. So what, what, what was the hardest lesson you had to learn in your career? I mean, people, people obviously probably know of most of your successes, but I think it's always interesting to just learn a little bit about what difficulties you faced <clears throat> and kind of what that taught you. Right. Well, the whole point is that you wouldn't know about the things that didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> They tend to remain in, sadly, they tend to remain in someone's drawer. Um, and that's the biggest frustration as a designer, I think, is to see your product, and I'm sure you experience that, this here as well, is, <laughs> is uh, to see your product um, kind of locked up, you know, in, in somebody's drawer. Um, the other lesson for me is that, is that um, it's possible for us to move mountains um, as designers. Uh, but the mountains have to want to move, and um, which means simply that um, when you're brought in as a designer in a situation where um, where there isn't really will to 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 go someplace new or to to experiment or to um, to to discover um, uh, or to get on a journey, it becomes very very difficult to do. And I probably spent most of the '90s here in Silicon Valley um, feeling pretty miserable about, about, um, about how people were looking at design. Um, you know, back then it was, there was no clear ROI on design. Nobody, you know, the first question you would get from anybody in business is, you know, like, really? I need to work with you guys? You know, my marketing guy says so, or my wife, or, you know, and they would be like, they would be like, you know, what's, uh, come on, between us, what's the ROI on design? Yeah. Tell me. Because, you know. It's like I, a deep, dirty secret or something. It's zero. Yeah, like. It's, like, it's like, you know, we all know there is none, right? Yeah. Um, and that You're was a con a, man. Yeah. <laughs> that, was, that was a pretty miserable time. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the, you know, the last 10, 15 years have been really, really good for us. Um, uh, so help here, us help us understand you know, what what changed though. I mean, you, you're well, 90s I mean, and you know post sure. post post like kind of the 2001 crash. Well, I think I think you know we have Steve Jobs to thank for our credibility, our newly found credibility in business. Um, you know, without 
without Apple and without Steve Jobs, the ROI would be somewhat unclear. And mm -hmm. with, with Steve Jobs and Apple, the ROI is pretty clear. Um, and of course, others have done it. I mean, you know, companies like Target and companies, uh, numerous startups, obviously. Um, and it seems today that, you know, we have a complete reverse, you know, re reversal of, um, of, um, of the attitude. You know, uh, it seems like people know pretty clearly that, uh, that design is going to play a key role in any new type of venture or in, in, in the future of any mature uh, type of business. But is that, is that achieved in a sustainable way? I mean, now you know, Steve Jobs has passed away. Mm -hmm. You know, Apple will, you know, at one point cease to exist. I mean, what, what makes design fundamentally important? Or well, how, do you, how do you, how do you, like, I mean, how, I mean, is this change that you've seen in Silicon Valley here to stay? I think, I think, I think the change that happened in the 50s, both in Europe and in the, in the United States, around design having a key role, has still impact today, you know, 60, 70 years later. Um, the work of you know, the, 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 the people I showed before is celebrated all around the world, still derives uh, economic um, value, um, and, uh, and certainly derives a lot of cultural value, um, both for this country and, 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 and in the rest of the world. So I do think that the, you know, historically the value of design you know, has been established by companies like Herman Miller, um, and, you know, maybe uh, Noel as well, obviously. And that's still something that obviously you guys live with. Yeah, and so how, how does working with a Herman Miller compare to working with maybe a more purely technology firm? You know, I mean, like a furniture, very physical object, you know, versus the more digital kind of yep. Silicon Valley based products. I, you know, I'm one of the people who say it's, it's not different at all. Um, for me, the, you know, the process which you can see online, the process we use to develop the sail chair here is the same kind of process we're using to develop a digital product or, or a very technologically advanced product. Um, it's a lot of thinking about the user. It's a lot about thinking about new technologies or new ways of doing things or what are the new um, you know, socioeconomic kind of factors in place that will influence the work that is being done now. Um, and it's a lot about s sketching and trying and failing and trying again and making mock-ups and uh, building and rebuilding and testing and breaking. I mean, it's, it's the process of design as being iterative, as, as, um, as, as kind of pushing the boundaries, as, as stretching the, the notion of what's possible. All of that is very much the same. And what about the role of actual technology in the design process? What do you, what do you guys use? What, what do you guys rely on? And how important is it in you know, improving the design process? So, so you know, the role of technology is, um, you know, in many ways central, and in many ways it is not. Um, um, ideas aren't technology generated. Um, drawing sketches, quick iterative things tend to be done by hand, um, um, you know, we draw, I mean, for this, this chair here, which you're seeing a more of a advertising shot for it there, um, you know, we generated about 70 functioning uh, prototypes just, uh, just within our studio, probably 100 and plus, you know, with, with the partnership with Herman Miller. We generated thousands of drawings, just like for a user, you know, a user flow or, uh, uh, user interface or, you know, you, you would generate lots and lots of um, different iterations, all centered around one idea. You know, we've, uh, you know, our process is never about splattering the world of possibilities, you know, on the wall and showing a client, oh, you know, these are the 20 different ways this can be done. What we do instead is we pick one thing that we think would be really extraordinary, really amazing to deliver, really sort of um, kind of put you over the top, right? And, and, and we go really, really deep into that and keep trying to reach um, um, this, this magical place. Um, but technology has a role when it comes to uh, building other types of prototypes, uh, digital prototypes, physical uh, uh, engineering prototypes, uh, when, it build, when, when it comes to testing, um, when it comes to sort of getting feedback, when it comes to get, you know, doing research, Technology has, a, has an important role there. But I don't see it, I, don't, I, I really see it as a tool. I don't see it as 
you know, the reason why you would, you know, you would do anything. And so, you know, in that process where you're coming up with thousands of drawings or hundreds of prototypes, right, where, where do you guys go or where does Eve go for inspiration? Like, what, what inspires you? Like, what do you do in your daily life? Or what are the most important drivers of, like, the thoughts in there? Um, so, so I'm, you know, I'm, again, I'm not somebody who is going to go and look at, just tell you that, oh, you know, nature inspires everything that we do. Or um, I'm, I'm much more sort of a product or all, you know, the numerous, the thousands of different inputs, the cultural inputs, uh, you know, everyday life inputs that we get, um, that, that we get in, in our lives. That said, my life is, um, is kind of almost split. Uh, uh, I have a, a city life that's very intense, you know, an office life that's very intense. Um, I tend to work with clients all over the world, you know, in urban centers, and so, you know, culture is a really important role in what we do. Travel. Um, travel, technology, you know, the sort of the intensity of, 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 of work and urban centers is important. But then I also have a whole part of my life which, which, um, which I spend in nature, uh, uh, physically. I surf, um, I, um, I spend time in, you know, a little village up north, you know, the coast. And, you know, this is, this is where the neurons are, you know, still firing, everything, everything processes, but the, um, you know, the, 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 the sort of the, 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 the environment is sort of cleaned up for, for inspiration and ideas to come. But, I mean, I'm not someone who, and it, you know, to me everything is mixed. I mean, it's not like I go into this little place and this is where I get all my ideas. Um, I think for most of us, um, you know, inspiration happens like all the time, continuously. And our jobs allow us to do that, right? I mean, we're not sort of expected to be just doing one thing today. We're expected to be, um, to have multiple roles, to have multiple uh, ways to input into, into the process. And, and, and I think that helps in some ways. So this seems tied to your concept of holistic making a little bit, maybe then. What, can, you, can you, I mean, I think some people might be familiar with it, but can you help perhaps explain this a little bit more, this, this kind of concept I think you're trying to, to bring to the conscious yeah. of... I mean, uh, you know, holistic making for me is, is the opportunity designers have today to take that 360-degree view um, and, and to really, again, not be used as, um, as, as, as just, you know, the, 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 the problem solver for, for one problem, which is a, a graphic problem or a user interface or... Um, a user experience problem or a physical, you know, a product problem. Um, what we're being seen as is, is, is somebody who, who, um, who can, you know, create cohesiveness across a lot of these different places. And I think it's it's widely understood today that, you know, consumer experiences cannot be dis, you know, di cannot have disconnected points. That they have to be that that you know what we are doing now is. We're really sort of serving an, you know, entire brand ecosystems um, uh, in a way that doesn't have these points of disconnects because those get noticed immediately. Um, those, those get, you know, those those points get pointed at immediately. And as designers, we can now look at things like, I mean, this is a very physical thing, but it's a kind of a cute project. Um, we can look, you know, we're, we're giving these sort of problems, which is oh, why don't you rethink the chandelier? And then you go like, well, what people love about chandeliers, um, you know, for, for centuries is, you know, all the sparkling little lights and the reflections and the sort of rainbow colors that happen when the light hits it, you know? And, and, and then, you know, in a holistic way, you're like, okay, so that's the experience that people are looking for. Um, not this ancient physical thing that has like thousands of crystals and you know, 20 or 30 light, you know, uh, 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 you know, lights or candles in the past uh, on it. And, and, you know, we built this thing out of doing all the reflections and all the magic with like one crystal and one specially to an LED light. And so holistically, we looked at the effect, we looked at uh, the sustainability, you know, pr proposition, uh, we looked at the attainability, making it affordable rather than very expensive. So. This is, you know, about a, you know, uh, has a bomb that makes this a, a product that could be retailed for like a hundred dollars, right? So we can look at all these different elements, including the packaging, and say, you know, this is this is a holistic experience. 
um, or it's looking at physical products like what I'm wearing here um, um, or, or you know, the first LED light here, but also the way you touch it and the way it feels um, under hand pressure and uh, looking at that first touch interface. This is a touch interface um, you know, before everything became touch, you know, yeah. before the iPhone. Um, um, what year was this? That was 2006. Yeah. So just before yeah. the. It's hard to imagine. Yeah, right? I know. <laughs> Kids now have to go up to TV screens, so they're broken, right? I know. So this, you know, you would just touch the surface. There was no button to turn it on and off. Um, you would just, you could change the intensity of the light or the coloration of the light. Um, and to me, that's sort of, you know, all this is, is, is holistic uh, making. Um, including, you know, thinking about the social ramifications of what it is that we do. In many ways, businesses can't really afford, afford to not look at, you know, sustainability or the social uh, uh, impact that they have as part of the product, as part of what it is that they make. Yeah. Um, one laptop per, per child. Being. This, is, this, is, uh, this is in Peru, um, and they have uh, one, million, one million laptops in, uh, in, in, in Peru. But... Um, so we do a lot of nonprofit uh, work. We do a lot of, um, I mean, just like Google, of course, but we do a lot of projects that, um, that try to bring the intelligence of design but to, to the widest possible uh, audience. And how do you um, justify the ROI of those projects? That's a good question. Um, we don't really. It's, um, I, think, I think there's an ROI in how you feel when you get up in the morning. So the emotions, yeah. <laughs> I think there is. Um, that said, I mean, um, I don't want to, I'll, uh, well, these are other things that we do, but, um, or, you know, like, like looking at sustainability as this incredible uh, opportunity to, um, um, you know, to, to make the entire experience better, not to make something recyclable or reusable or, or uh, using less energy or, um, um, uh, but, but actually looking at the engagement at the end and making that even, um, uh, even better. So we can think about all these things holistically. But this is a program that I'm particularly excited about and proud of because in many ways, this is a nonprofit program for a Mexican, um, uh, for the government of Mexico and a nonprofit in Mexico that distributes eyeglasses to children. They can pick the top and bottom color so they become really um, involved into um, their own glasses. There's a big stigma in, in uh, everywhere in the world, but in South America, against wearing uh, glasses. And so this makes them more personal and makes them wear them. But as designers, we can figure out how these things are built, how they're robust, you know, how, they're, how they cost um, $5 to make, including the custom-made lenses. Um, and, but then, so you do something like this, which is nonprofit. And then you, you know, the, the working on the, under these extreme constraints makes you look at the entire sort of value chain and the entire logistics system and in a new way. Beyond the actual object. Down to the actual object, but also the distribution, yeah. how they're picked, how. Um, and then what you realize is, you know, I did something for this nonprofit, but there's a whole business model here. So we're building a, a, a for profit version of this, sort of starting from the nonprofit, going to a for-profit version of this, which, um, which will finance the nonprofit, um, but also create um, uh, a sustainable business. Um, we just not launched, um, actually, um, a bus that's um, in, uh, in the East Bay that's uh, distributing eyeglasses, uh, these very eyeglasses. The same actually. ones that are going to Mexico. Yeah, the same ones. Um, to um, to kids up here, so we've, we're already moving the the um, some of the aspects of the nonprofit up here. And the one laptop per child is a similar story, right? It was meant for Africa, but it's been used all over, right? Yeah, I mean, in a way, you know, the the, the hundred dollar laptop kind of made made this idea that a smaller, lighter um, uh, computer is something that was desirable, which we had heard from certain people in the industry uh, wasn't. Um, and, and so in a way, it, it, it kind of, um, and Google was, is, is a huge supporter of the, yeah. the $100 laptop. Um, but, but so in a way, it, it kind of initiated maybe a, um, a, you know, a, a different look at, at, this, at, the, at the space. 
Um, but it's most prominent now, the $100 laptop is most prominent in South America. Wow, yeah, which is totally different from its original, I mean, the original mission was Africa. Well, it was global, global but we, the, the first uh, large tests and the first large distributions were Sub -Saharan in Africa. Africa yeah. Yeah. So what is Eve's dream project? I mean, you've had the chance to work on chairs, you've had the chance to work on glasses, you've had the chance to work on you know, quantified self wristbands. Like, what, right. is, what, is, what is your dream project in many ways? So my advice <clears throat> to, um, to all designers is not to have a dream project. Um, because if you have a dream project um, and, and, and you know, you're not going to consider everything that you work on as a potential dream project. And I can promise you, I can assure you that you know, the first couple of meetings that I have with Puma and they're like, oh, we want you to rethink our shoe box. You know, it's like, oh, can I work on the shoes? Until I, until I realize, you know, <laughs> <laughs> until I realize, um, <laughs> wow, no, the shoebox is going to have a much bigger impact. The shoebox is, is 80 million shoes that get shipped around uh, by this one brand. And, and, and the, the consequences, rather than a small, you know, kind of hipster line of shoes, you know, that gets into a few kind of cool stores, I realized the impact of the shoebox is actually so much bigger, so much more important, so much more long-lasting. Um, and so I turned the shoebox into what you know, many people would now consider a dream project um, because, because you have this big impact, because it's global. That chart that you were showing before. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, this one. Um, you know, and so, so many of the projects that have come through to us, I'm, I'm just somebody who gets really excited about the really big potential of it, and I tend to see beyond maybe even the, you know, the frame and the limits that, 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 um, that, that you know, clients have, have brought this, these projects, um, you know, within those frames and limits. Um, and I think I've turned a few, you know, in the team at Fuse Project has turned a few things into, into potential dream projects. But I can guarantee you that's not what they seem to be, you know, at, um, at, the, at the onset. Um, and so, I, you know, I, I, I think that's, that's the best... Um, dream project. That's a, yeah, yeah, it's the best way to live in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Without a dream project, because if you know, if you're constantly thinking about, oh, you know, I, I, you know, if if I worked on a car, if I worked on a train, you know, then then I would, you know, really, you know, make it. Then yeah. I would, you know, then I would live, you know, the designer dream. Um, you know, the, you can spend a, a career waiting for that. So then let's get a little more abstract then. What is, the, what is the biggest challenge that you think design needs to solve in the you know, coming years, decades, right? What, what are you most excited about in terms of maybe a space? Well, I think the, 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 um, the things that design, the design is going to solve um, um, are, are, a few, you know, are a few simple notions. I mean, every business is going to become sustainable one way or the other. Um, there's absolutely no way we're going to... The current infrastructure is going to remain as is. So at every at every stage, you know, when you're rethinking uh, um, uh, the way things are done, the way things are built, the way things are shipped, the way things are consumed, um, um, you know, sustainability is going to have a, a very important uh, role in that. And that means you, you know, designers have this amazing opportunity to participate, uh, you know, in things like the Puma shoebox, which is a Logistics and distribution, and you know, uh, uh, manufacturing, you know, uh, manufacturing uh, type of problem, but also a consumer and engagement and uh, uh, um, you know type of uh, type of design opportunity. Um, and so I think everything is going to have to be rethought in this way. And when you have to remake every factory, or when you have to reconceive, um, you know, the way the way everything is 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 made, uh, designers are going to have an incredible uh, role to play in that. I also think that technologies is the other huge opportunity because um, technology is still, you know, has still numerous sort of uh, barriers, and in many ways making it attainable in the sense of easy, approachable, um, sort of uh, magical, not, you know, not disruptive. Um, um, you know, I think I think we're, you know, I mean, just looking at the idiosyncrasies of the ways that we use technology today. 
um, there's some, you know, there's some some huge improvements that uh, that that are going to go on, and they're going to, in my opinion, are going to be design driven. Great. So, I've asked all the questions that I have. I think there's a number of Googlers here. I think that would love to to have uh, the time to or chance to ask you a question. So, I open up to the audience. Looks like there's one back there. Yeah, so, so the question is, you know, what, it, what is the, the proportion of time that I spend or maybe that my team spends coming up with ideas versus implementing them, um, um, you know, sort of crafting the, the sort of final um, um, bits of, the, of, of, those, of those products or experiences. Um, you know, it's, it's to me, if we, don't, if we don't spend the time to be there all the way through, Till the final implementation, till the final refinement. Um, you know, um, um, if we're not there at the end, sort of doing quality control to make sure that you know the big idea, the big design, the the the, the, the visual, the experience we've created um, isn't exactly as conceived at the end, um, we're going to ship products that um, that are going to be mediocre. Or that are not going to achieve the, the you know their full potential, so we actually spent a lot of time, you know, at the very onset, you know, how do, you know what's the name of the company, what's the what's the big story here, right? Making the product again, digital or physical, and and testing it and using it and living with it, um, you know, all the way through the end, so that when it, when it comes out, um, you know, the 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 design criteria, the things you got excited about. In the beginning, um, the, the the pillars that you've created for this um, this brand or product are still there. So for me, it's completely critical that as designers, we stay engaged all the way through. And um, it's not just like passing the baton to a developer or to to an engineering group or to a manufacturer. You really have to be um, there all the way. Um, that just means. Uh, just engaging over over a long period of time, um, and uh, and being fully supported in that engagement, obviously with with whoever you work with. So, um, on that topic, my question is actually about platforms and what role design takes in actually establishing or building or creating platforms that other people build upon, and what role uh, like phone or Android. Or better microphones. Um, <laughs> when other people ultimately like uh, have to build on uh, the thing that you've created, is there sort of a handoff? How far do you go down the path of making things fairly restrictive in terms of the things that people build, or even like uh, the OLPC, like the apps that people would build there? How do you communicate, I guess, the things that you were trying to achieve, mm -hmm. and then help them actually extend the value of what you were creating, as opposed to diminish that value? Yeah. I, I mean, I think I think it's essential to 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 create products and experiences that fit within the the current ethos, which is people want to be able to modify, change, own, you know, this sort of just in time mentality um, that we that we're all experiencing today. Um, you know, I'm, I'm taking a picture and I'm posting it. I mean, immediately. If I wasn't doing that, I probably wasn't. You know, I I I, I wouldn't take the picture. Anymore, right? I mean, it used to be that I would wait a week for wait a week for that picture to be developed and handed back to me. Um, so, so in many ways, I think the platforms have to sort of tap into what what um, simply is is the current way everybody lives, which is um, uh, instant. Um, you know, and at the same time, you want to be able to have some things there that ensure a level of quality or a level of um, you know, even potentially design, but I, I think it's an interesting mix between you know providing um, a well-designed you know platform um, and that 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 is sort of solid and exciting and that people can kind of uh, that that people really want, and at the same time leaving enough there for other people to own and to build on top of. So I think that's that's definitely very different from. Designing products that that never change, that that um, that uh, or that are that are very, um, you know, restrictive in a in a sense. Pass it to the. Hi, so you said your number one design principle is to 
to think about the user experience and not really aesthetics. In your mind, what's an example of a really ugly but well-designed product? I don't know. I mean, I don't know if it's you know, I don't know if the paper clip is ugly. I, mean, I don't think it's ugly. Um, 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 I, you know, I, I don't know that that product would be ugly on purpose, unless you know, sort of there was a reason for it to be uh, to be ugly. But I, um, do you, do you have something in mind? No, no. I was it's, <laughs> it's, I was just wondering. I'm trying to understand your principle. I mean, in many ways, I think. Um, for something to be to be to be beautiful is 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 a function as well. It isn't just um, you know sort of a you know I, I don't see the two the two elements as separate. So I think I think um, you you know you you probably have some you know very useful things that are very ugly. I mean I'm sure I see them every day, um, um, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't make them sort of the you know the perfect product or. Or, um, or the end or end all and be all of, of what this uh, this thing could be or do for you. Um, so you talked about the role um, that, that industrial design firms in the 90s started more and more um, also taking on strategy, understanding that need to transform organizations to be successful. Yeah. Um, given that, though, I mean, what is what is the differentiating role of the traditional industrial design aspect, the form giving, the speaking through form? Is that still relevant as a differentiator? I mean, you're now competing against strategy firms, against you know firms that don't have the design aspect, but maybe covering a lot of other aspects that organizations are looking for. I think I think there was certainly in the '90s a whole tendency to go towards um, management consulting, mm -hmm. um, and I, you know, I think I think um, there are all kinds of interesting reasons to do that, but they're not the ones that um, were shaping. You know our firm around. Um, we believe in making. Uh, we I believe in organizational change by making by example. Um, I do believe that um, when projects uh, anywhere in any business um, um, kind of uh, sort of acquire a level of success by having been done differently or by having by by proving that the company can do things differently or achieve things differently is a much better way. To um, to do management, you know, change or education, um, than just trying to um, have a few, you know, brainstorms with top management. Um, and so, I think I think what you need to find though is you need to find companies that will um, that will open up the door for this to happen. That will say, okay, well, you know, we'll give a chance for something different to 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 happen and 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 prove that there is a new. Um, you know, a new approach that we're not familiar with that um, um, that could be successful, and we find more and more of those companies now. Um, we, you know, we're not really competing because we're, we're we don't deliver a strategy product, or we don't deliver a um, you know, we don't even deliver a product product per you know per se only. You know, what we do is we we build brands and we build businesses, and and in that sense. Um, there's um, definitely a recognizable fuse project identity that kind of weaves through a lot of the physicalness of, of the products, right? The, or anywhere from perfume bottles to like some of the watches and some of the things where there's some unique aspect that I would say is still there and that maybe right. consciously people will feel attracted to. Yeah, I mean, we definitely want people to be attracted to what <laughs> we do. Um, and so, so being attractive or being successful for our products is a, a key element. Um, and I could certainly uh, say that that's that's um, that's intentional. That's something we look for. You know, we don't we we don't really uh, unless you know unless there is a role of a lab you know more of a laboratory type of project or experimental type of project. The goal is certainly for things to reach uh, as many people as possible and uh, and make whatever idea or business or experience. Uh, um, understood and, and, and adopted and loved. So, All right, well, I think we're out of time. If you have still a question, just come up and ask Eve, but let's all welcome him or thank him for coming down. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was awesome.